Hey, how's it going, you guys? Welcome to Jason Unleashed. I'm your host, Jason Carter. Thank you for watching. So excited for today's show because my week of celebrating women in media rolls on with someone who is simply stellar. She is a best-selling author. She is a host. She is an attorney. And she's one of my favorite people. I'm talking about Ebony K. Williams from Revolt TV's State of the Culture. She's here now. Let's bring her in. Doom, 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 doom. I gotta do this dance while we're waiting for her to connect. <laughs> go, Ebony. Go, Ebony. E! Jason, what's oh up, my, my love? Hold on. Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Hold on a second. Let me let me let me fix this. Okay. Uh, are we are we good? We're good. Okay, I couldn't hear you. But you can hear me now. I can hear you now. Lovely. <laughs> glad, hey, glad to see you, Ebony. How are you doing? You know, babe, I'm I'm making it. I'm doing as well as could be expected, uh, healthy and blessed, um, and getting through like everybody else. I mean, crazy times. Getting through, like I said, it's great to see you. I mean, we've been friends for a while, and your career yeah. has yeah. just, it's been so <laughs> joyous and wonderful to watch you from starting here at KFI in LA to us kicking it at After Buzz TV. Listen, yes, honey. <laughs> and starting BHL with um, our dear friend, uh, Daryl, Daryl, uh, Daryl. It's been great. Yeah. yeah, Daryl, yeah, so it's, it's been amazing. It's been amazing, but your journey has been incredible. So let, let's get into this one. You're doing good in quarantine. Congratulations on your engagement. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. You're that, such that a rock. You, I mean, oh, you just... <laughs> <laughs> he did well, good, he did good. Yeah, he absolutely did good. But I mean, he has to. I mean, you're a queen. You're a queen. You're an author, best-selling author. <laughs> you're you're an accomplished yeah. attorney, and you oh, are such you. a force in media for people of color. Let's take it back to to some of the times where that were truly impactful for you. You at Fox News, and we're going to talk about state of the culture because mm -hmm. that is is something that is not, unlike anything we've seen on digital and TV right now. But we're going to get to that. Let's go back to Fox sure. News. E, okay. Southern Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, Very I'll much so. Uh, Tar Hill, New Orleans, Yoyola Yolo Marymount, which we, yeah. I'm a New Orleans native too. My family's from New yeah. Orleans. So I'm there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, you, you end up at Fox News, which has been now more than ever a very polarizing and kind of... Um, I would say, controversial place. Tell us about that experience, because as a woman of color navigating that, how was, mm -hmm. how was that for you? Yeah, controversial is putting it incredibly gently, right, Jason? Uh, so it was, <laughs> listen, I say, I say this, and I'll say it again to you. I did not go to Fox News to be comfortable, right? So um, I have many things, naive is not one of them. I knew with Fox News before walking into the building. And I will say this. And this is true of any network and really any organization, but especially a network that has the, the energy, the vibrato, the epitus of a place like Fox News. You have to know exactly who the hell you are before you walk through the door. Because if you in any way are waiting for validation, waiting for approval, that's from the viewership or the executive team um, to inform you of who you are, uh, you will struggle deeply. In fact, you will probably, it will probably be your undoing. Yeah. Um, so I want to say that my ability to navigate um, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, because those were two different navigation processes, to be clear, uh, was largely due to, of course, my faith in God, staying true to my intention, Jason, that I established prior to going into the network. Um, I went there for a very specific purpose. I was very committed to showing up as a proud, educated, informed Black woman and speaking to um, the, the political issues that the network covered, because whether we like it or not, their, their audience is the biggest uh, news audience in the world. And Can't it is what that. it is. You cannot right. deny that. And there's a consequence around that, right? That the, the reality is, and of course, everybody was awakened to this reality in 2016 with our current president's election. Um, sadly, it was something I knew much prior to. There's a huge part of our demographic in this country, Jason, that only get their news from that from network. Fox. Right. Only, exclusively. Honey, they put it on at, at 7 o'clock for Fox and Friends, and it stays on till 12 at night. Yep. Um, so therefore, I thought it was incredibly important uh, to be a representative for our people and to represent just an entirely different type of Black person than they'd ever seen and probably would ever know in their real life. Um, 
but it ran its course. Um, I think I, I did incredible work there, but then at some point it was time for me to take my talents beyond that space um, and have impact elsewhere. I would, I would agree. And you know, you are someone who I look at as a disruptor, really, because mm. any space you move in, you, you shake it up. And not to say you shake it up in a, in a dramatic way. Are you having a drink every year? Honey, because I knew you was going to go into that Fox News bag, honey. I had to pour me a cocktail. <laughs> okay, well, what? I, where's my, I, 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 it's five o'clock sober, right? But then every yeah. reaches for the glass and she's like, I'm here with, this is water, everyone, in my, in my, bar, in my Dickies barbecue cup. I'm going to take a yeah. deep split. So, so Jason, I am getting some comments that we have some feedback. I am wearing headphones, but do you think I should take them out? Um, yeah, take them out. Are we good? Can you hear me? Boom. I can hear you. Let's try this. Okay, cool. Cool. Awesome. Uh, disruptor. You, you, you shake things up and you, you get people to think. And I mean, from HLN to CBS, NFL, the NBA, I mean, every place you go, you leave this mark. Moving at Fox. And then we're not, I'm only, only going to touch on Fox a little bit longer because I think. Every time funny. you say Fox, I'm going to drink. <laughs> okay. We're going to have you drunk by the time you're done with this. But, but. Honestly, honestly speaking, though, I mean, you're in a space that behind closed doors, I'm sure you met some some kind of hairy situations. How did you temper the public mm. accepting you in that space? Because we're at a time where people have no no problem disapproving of everything and anything you do, especially being a woman of color. Sure. Well, you know this, Jason. Again, we, we go way back and we've been in the business a long time. So I think audiences are a lot like dogs. And I say this in this way, when they can sniff, sniff out, sniff out, suss out, that you are expecting approval of them or you are operating on air and in that space for their consideration, they're gonna lean in. They're gonna lean into that and they're gonna, they're gonna take advantage of that. And that's the reality, that's human nature. Yeah. But when you show up unapologetically who you are, right, whatever that is, and this goes in politics, this goes in lifestyle, this goes in um, entertainment media, it doesn't matter, right? Just unapologetically only who you are. I have found through my experience and all the platforms you've graciously named that I've been privileged to appear upon, there is a respect. That's what it is. So at Fox, for instance, oftentimes I was a dis not only a disruptor, but I was typically the dissenting point of view, right? I did not share the politics of the network, and that was pretty obvious. But what I always, even now, I haven't been on Fox in over two years now, but even now, Jason, I go to the airports in Atlanta and kind of in the, the Bible Belt, and, and super far-right conservatives, MAGA country, all day say, you know what, Ebony? I didn't always agree with you, but I really respected how you showed up rooted in fact. You were always prepared. You handled yourself as a professional. And that is something to me. It changed the way I viewed whether it was Black Lives Matter or um, deferred prosecution or things in the criminal justice system. It, it really had an impact. So I would say that. I would say don't seek approval or validation from your audience. Seek your audience's respect. Right, right. And as an attorney, I love how you view things through a, a legal lens, how you, you approach things a little differently. So let's move on to, to um, state of the culture, because as I said, Revolt TV killing the game, but this show, and I have watched, one, the episodes are long. You gotta sit in to stay in the culture. No, it's a commitment. <laughs> it's, a, but, it's a commitment, but I'm here for it. But nothing like we've seen on TV, because here you have, you have Brand, Brandon Jenkins, Remy Ma, Joe Budden, pump, pump, <laughs> pump it up. You know, like you have, <laughs> seriously. And yeah. then we have you who has this, this, this legal acumen and, the versatility you bring to that and the conversations you guys have, you guys will pivot from fashion and celebrating Remy's Balenciagas to yeah. going in on Gail King and Kobe Bryant. Yeah. What is the magic? How did this magic come to be with this show? Because there's, there's a lot of things that claim to be for the culture and they miss the mark. This hits the target, yeah? Absolutely. So the, the show um, is, a, is a brainchild, from my understanding, um, Puff, our, our chairman, Mr. Uh, Sean Diddy Combs, 
really wanted to create a talk show, like you said, for the culture. So he reached out actually to a good friend of mine also, Charlemagne the God. They had a conversation. And ultimately, Char connected up to Joe Button, who at that time was a rising social commentator. Like you said, we all know Joe from college days, pump, pump, pump it up. But Joe made a real calculated decision that he wanted to take his voice um, to the commentary and hosting space. Anyway, those two came together, Joe and Puff, and decided they were going to create this thing, this thing that had no bounds, this thing that was raw, that was unfiltered. Being on Revolt, it allows us to, we don't have a desk in front of us. And I have to tell you, I love that, Jason. You know, have it coming from news, coming from a variety of platforms that are fantastic in their own right. But often that desk, I find it, I, I would love to actually know your take, because I know you sit behind a desk when you were at the and the Turks, and the desk can be stifling. Yeah. The desk can almost serve as this barrier. Um, and it could create a, a limitation, I will say that. That has been my experience. Do you feel that way? Oh, 100%. I also think it has to do with the outlet as well, because as you know, we are given direction. You know, we are, we are a bot product that checks a box for a certain reason um, for the audience. And so you are given marching orders on how to be that check box for said network. Um, I agree with you, though. I think, and, and it comes across watching State of the Culture on Revolt because you guys, I mean, there's times where it's a little uncomfortable, where, oh. where, <laughs> where even I'm cringing, and not cringing in a way e, that is like, I can't watch this because it's never unwatchable because sometimes that uncomfortability, like you say, you don't need to move in a space to be comfortable, right? right? There's a compelling nature and something that draws you in in those uncomfortable experiences. So removing the desk allows for that or more organic experience with you, the audience, and the co-host balancing those elements. But I mean, watching the show, there's been times where I've seen you, and which speaks to your versatility, where you've had to, where you've disagreed with Remy. Case in point, where, um, I'm not gonna talk about the case, but a woman accepted a settlement for a sexual yeah. assault charge, yeah. right? And Remy felt that that was a form of prostitution. Mm -hmm. And you countered that with, no, that is her way of healing and dealing with that. And that exchange sparked the debate and conversation within Black Twitter and the culture of, well, who's wrong and who's right? And it's those conversations on the show like that that are so needed that people try to have inorganically and again, miss the mark. Yeah, it, 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 it's a good opportunity though, right, Jason, like you said. Because my thing is, I never expect people to agree with me or agree with Ram or Joe. It's not about that. To me, agreement is highly overrated. Yeah. These shows are not for you to be TV or TV or TV. The comments and, and I get it. it, it lends itself to that, you know, dynamic. I want to blow that whole dynamic up. Yeah. Throw that dynamic away. That dynamic to me is not productive, right? What's important is the conversation, Jason. You have yes. to know the fact that wherever you fall on the issue, you're talking about it. You're thinking about it in a different way. So on that particular topic, you know, Jason, I'm coming in with a very unique vantage point because I have literally been the attorney for young women and actually one young man who was had to seek a judicial remedy through a civil settlement. That was the only, there wasn't the evidence therefore criminal case. There wasn't, you know, there, there was just no other legal remedy. So therefore this is our only opportunity to justice. So hell no, I'm not gonna rain on that. I'm not going to shun that. I'm going to honor that and I'm gonna respect that because I come from that aspect of the system. Remy, of course, very different experience. They're both valuable. Right, they're both valuable. They both cause people to think about their internal value system on these issues. And when we do that, Jason, we've done our job. Hundred percent. And and, and I, that's a great point because from that conversation, it caused me to think on my internal value system as to if I had been and I I have never been a victim of sexual assault, so I don't ever want to say that I can imagine what that experience like for those who have been. Right. Um, but it caught it's 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 like um, when you have. Again, we talk about politics and you have, you know, blacks for Trump and people who who are staunch supporters and you think, OK, where is this coming from and how can I try to accept or put myself in their shoes to, to wrap my head around something that seems so foreign to mm -hmm. me? And I think shows like State of the Culture are essential right now, because, again, a lot of people are trying to do that and they're not and they're not and they're not getting it together. And it's, it's they're, you know what it is, Jason? because they're coming to the table with answers not questions, you know, and you know this um, because of your work in the, in the industry. Um, that's not the magic. The magic to me 
the magic is not in commentating. The magic is in the exchange of the question, you know, the curiosity. And I will say, I think that's really uh, the key to the success of State of the Culture. Everybody on our show, and I got to tip my hat, especially to Joe Budden, who's our, our primary host and moderator. Joe is genuinely curious about these things. You know, that's why, you know, when you see a rundown that goes from a, an interview with uh, Senator Kamala Harris all the way to a versus battle between RZA and DJ Premier, it's because our curiosity spans that scope. You know, right. it's about this and that. Oh, and by the way, did y'all watch The Last Dance on ESPN documenting uh, Jordan's run with the Bulls? Like, it's all of that. So I think right. they show up naturally curious, organically curious. I think that's why Oprah was incredibly successful. It wasn't because Oprah knew everything or had all the answers and knew the right things to say always. She actually certainly didn't. Um, but she was always curious. And I think right. that curiosity in our, in our business um, is underrated. Right. Ebony, would you say that you're the most conservative on the show, though? No. I mean, to be candid, you know, we haven't really get, gotten into deep political conversations. So I don't really know where Joe and Remy's politics are or, and, and Jinx. Not, not I, can't, I, can't, I can't misspeak because, you know, it's funny that we talk about conservatism and liberalism, right? And in this age of Trump, to me, the, the actual definitions have been lost uh, because when you talk about conservatism, what you're really talking about traditionally is fiscal conservatism, right? Yeah. Um, limited spending, small government. These are the definitions. Now it's become pro-Trump, which if you look at the administration, very little of it is fiscally conservative. Very little of it is about small. It's not really a conservative government in my, right. Opinion, right. my academic opinion. Um, so yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. So I can't, I can't take that, um, but I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. That's the evolution <laughs> of the show, absolutely. Well, you, you are a best selling author pretty powerful yeah. and it's pretty powerful <laughs> 2017 you. you gave us this book that has gotten stellar reviews way reviews people really really attach themselves to the sentiment in that book being an author one when was the moment you decided that hey this is another avenue that i want to venture down and give this to my people and to my public what what, what was that decision process like because ebony you're no stranger to revealing and sharing your truth with the masses. So it's funny, Jason, I never had a plan to write a book. I never saw myself as a writer. That was not a part of my uh, grand scheme. It was actually the former uh, CEO of Fox News who said to me, uh, Roger Ailes said, if you're gonna be on this network, and I think this is true for anybody that has any kind of platform, and you are going to have the, um, the leverage of an audience, you should always be selling them something, period. That's just a pure business strategy. So I was like, that's interesting. He's like, so if you're, you're on whatever, O'Reilly or whatever, you're getting 3 million eyeballs, that's, that's a two second hit. What's the, what's the payoff? How do you extend that, and extend that impact? So that was the, the, the catalyst for Pretty Powerful. Yeah. Pretty Powerful was supposed to be a political book, right? Because like you said, you check boxes, boxes are a political book. And then I realized, Anybody could write a political book. I was going to write a book called Madam President. It was going to be all the women run for the presidency. Been done before, will be done again. Generic. I wanted to tell a story that was unique to me, Jason, and a yeah. story that, again, I was curious about. I knew there was no way in the world I could be the only person, and especially the only Black woman, that was facing this conflict of, I care about what I look like. It's been ingrained in my head that it matters and it has an impact. But I'm also really committed to my academics and I'm really committed to doing well professionally. And I want to be taken seriously because I'm a serious person when it comes to certain things. So that tension, right? That's, that was the Oedipus of Pretty Powerful. How do we eradicate the notion that you have to be either or? You have to either be attractive and, and, and aesthetically pleasing or you have to be credible and smart and intelligent and hardworking. That's a bullshit uh, tension, in my opinion. Right. And I wrote Pretty Powerful for my 14-year-old self. And it's, right. I call it my love letter to Black women, Jason, because so many of us struggle with that. And, right. and, and it be, it's beyond Black women, but specifically, uh, the world has done us a disservice by not creating space for that duality. And Pretty Powerful is, um, is a roadmap. 
for how you can create that duality for yourself. And I love that. And you, you talk about duality and, and either or, right? Because, you know, how do you wrestle with people? Now more than ever, e, we are in a space where, again, with social media and how volcanic every single landscape is in regards to race relations, politics, LGBTQ+, uh, gender identity, things of that nature. People love to, I mean, we're, we're, we're still looking for an identity, be, especially be marginalized groups of people. Totally. How do you, what do you say to people who, who tell you, oh, Ebony Williams, you're not black enough. You're not, you, you, you have to move through the world as this type of black person, knowing that we're not monolithic, we're not homogenous. However, there are people who still find comfort in, in, in their blackness and tell you that you are not black enough. How do you deal with that? Well, the first thing I do is I let them get a full look at my shirt. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. But um, <laughs> not really. Um, you hit the nail on the head. You were interviewing one of your uh, dynamic guests earlier this week. And by the way, I want to take one second to commend you, Jason, for having the wherewithal and the professionalism to create this platform for Thank yourself you. and for your your viewership and your community that you've built. Um, it's been fantastic. I have Thank thoroughly you. enjoyed the episodes. My favorite being Claudia Jordan, because as a pageant girl, honey, I stand for some Claudia Jordan. Same. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. No, seriously. Um, so you said to, to one of your guests that we got a serious problem in our Black community with wanting to police Blackness. And that was a word. You know, we really got to get beat. And I, and I know where it comes from, or I, su I, I suspect where it comes from. When you're a marginalized group um, and you feel you are beholden to outside interlopers defining who you are, what you can do, what, what permission you have to move through a climate and a society, um, you want to exercise some form of control of your own, right? right. Because historically you've been stripped of, of domain and of authority. So what do we do? We, we turn that internal. And now we exercise that domain, that authority, that, that policing. We can't police the greater society because they made it clear that they're going to be the ones policing us. So what right. do we do? We police each other. Yeah. That's where that comes from. And we really got to do better. Um, so yeah, of course, I've gotten that dumb shit my whole life. You talk like a white girl. Uh, da, 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 da. And, and here's what I say to that, Jason. I, again, I get where that comes from. I, I have never, nor do I, honey, I got a strong black mama named Gloria J. Williams, who always, and, and I credit her with this, um, made it completely powerful to be black in our home. You know, it was something like for Christmas, Jay, I would get Cabbage Patch and Barbie dolls, but I was literally getting books on, um, you know, uh, Sojourner Truth and Phyllis Wheatley and Eldridge Cleaver, I mean, from eight, nine years old. So I was extremely well, -versed. again, I knew who I was. You know, going back to the Fox metaphor, right? I knew exactly who I was and the value, the incredible value of my blackness. So I never saw my blackness as a um, disadvantage or something to be, to apologize for or be ashamed of or now, nah, like this is, this is actually my crown. Yeah. So with that, I know that a lot of my counterparts don't necessarily see that when they look at me. What I'm not about to do is sit here and explain this stuff and apologize to you. But what I will do um, is invite you invite you to be a part of my approach to blackness which is that of black excellence like that's how i see it right so when you see when, I, when i'm the only black girl in the ib class or ap class in school or one of only 12 black women to graduate from my law school class or the only black woman at fox don't look at that as an aspiration to whiteness because it is not it's an aspiration to excellence and that is the difference that Mike is dropped. I, I mean, I'm done I, with that topic. And, and that's all. <laughs> Take a drink. Have a sip. Have a sip. <laughs> I mean, Ebony, the word, the word this morning on a, on a Thursday. You are fearless. Yeah. Fearless. And the definition of fearless is what? Lack, lack of fear. Of removal but you know what? It's not that. And I love you for saying that, Jason. It's not. I'm, a, I'm human. I get scared sometimes. What you scares know? you? Oh, shit. I, every day I get some form of fear, right? But what I'm okay doing is doing it scared. I am very okay doing it scared. Um, I, I technically have a little bit of fear going on right now. We're going to tape State of the Culture tomorrow, um, and it's going to air on Monday. And there's a topic that we are going to discuss um, that uh, our chairman, Mr. Combs, has 
he's the topic, essentially. It's something that, that he put out into the ethos. Uh, I have a viscerally uh, different opinion of, of, of our chairman. So do I have some fear around how that's going to play out when I express my, my disagreement on his platform, technically? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have some fear, some concern around that. But I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> you know, because cause that's, what, that's what I'm called to do. Right. That's what I'm called to do. You, in August of uh, 2017, you had the Ebony docket, and you... Oh, yes. And, no, which, but um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, going back to Fearless, that was a moment for America um, that was met with deep emotion, and you're on, you were on a platform that celebrated a person who, who had some very egregious things to say about what happened and mm -hmm. you were still not afraid to say your truth and of course of course right after that the onslaught of all hell broke but, I mean, but where did that bravery you don't see it a lot ebony of people i mean okay look sean combs diddy one of the one of the richest people in America, I think, and it has this fabled career in music and has changed the game on so many platforms of not only hip hop, but business and has been of the culture, but yet has been able to permeate pop culture, period. You, right. That is your boss. You, like you said, there's, you, you visually disagree with something you're gonna talk about, but you still have to go and do your job. That's brave, that's bravery. There's some people who, who would not do that. Where does that come from? Where did, who, how is that muscle flexed? I'm glad you asked that because I, I can't even take credit for it. It's not like, because I'm a bad bitch. No, that's not why. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, it's my spirituality. That's where that comes from. So not to get all preachery. I feel like I say this in every interview I Go do. Go for it. No, no, no. Somehow I keep preaching, Jason. Um, I do this work because it's my spiritual calling, Jason. Some people are called to the pulpit. I am called to media, OK? I, I am called to be a messenger on behalf of my people. Uh, I was having a wonderful career practicing law in the courtroom. I loved it. It was incredibly successful. And then God had a message for me that says, I have a greater assignment for you. Okay. So that's literally why I left the courtroom and went to our world of media, of broader broadcast to get the message across in a broader way. Therefore, when I wake up on the day after Charlottesville, Jason, there was no, no option but to. So there, there was really no option to go in there and read the script and kiki and ha 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 and toss the commercial. Like, cause that's not my assignment. And right. it's not up to me. It's up to the man above. He put me there for a particular purpose. And in that day, Jason Carter, um, in the wake of such obvious and visceral ugliness, if I am not going to use the, the fact I'm the one in the building. God has put me in the seat. God gave me in this moment, pushed O'Reilly out. So I'm not just a contributor or an analyst. I am hosting the show, which means I have some level of editorial control. I get two and a half minutes straight to camera for my words to be put out to that particular audience. Oh, I had to report to duty. Yeah. Bus, yes. I had to report to duty. So... That's what that was. I cannot take credit. It's not because I'm so bossy or fearless or any of that. I'm just being a, a spiritual servant. I'm only honoring the spiritual gifts God has given me. And it, it takes a certain type of person to recognize that. I mean, you are a frequent guest on The Breakfast Club. And you told Love Charlene that. that, yeah, I mean, you're, you're like an honorary, you're an honorary cast member of The Breakfast Club. For, for, you're, it's like, where's E today? I think she's on The Breakfast Club. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, you told Charlemagne and Angela Yee and, and DJ MB that, that once you are not able to affect change, that it was time for you to go. Yeah. You, knew, you knew that it, it was a wrap. And I think there's something to be said about someone who is that present and themselves spiritually and their value you know, the, the, your tweet about uh, Scottie Pippen's contract and about signing your life away and not, not reading the fine print and get it together, that also speaks to knowing when it's time to exit stage left. Yeah. When, you're val when you cannot add value. Not, I'm not saying, Ebony, that you're not adding value in any capacity, because you, you do. You wouldn't be there if you weren't adding value. But to know spiritually and to have a, and to have, again, the wherewithal to be like, okay, you know what?
I've done all I can here. And if the greater good isn't, get, isn't, being, isn't getting the good, then you know what, let's close the door, start the car and keep it pushing. And, and then and that- Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, when I left Fox, because again, I find, you know, I had the, um, and it took a while to get there, Jason. I want to be candid. That was yeah. not, okay, done. No, it took a minute for me to, to test that. You know, is there an opportunity for me to keep going here? And I had the, um, they pushed me after, after Charlottesville docket, um, after all hell broke up, they pushed me to weekend anchoring, which actually ended up being a gift because it really taught me how to anchor a, a proper newscast. Um, but also it allowed me to interview some newsmakers. So I actually had an opportunity to interview uh, who was then running um, a pretty shifty campaign for governor of Georgia, Brian Kent. Yeah. So I interviewed Brian Kemp and I was able to be super direct, like, bruh, are you suppressing the vote in Georgia? Because that's certainly what it looks like to me. You know, but after enough of those opportunities, my role got smaller, 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 smaller. And then that's when I realized, okay, right. if I can't at least do this much, if I can't show up in these moments and, and push the narrative forward in this way, there is, there's no more room for me here and I need to go. Now, keep in mind, just when I left, I didn't have the next opportunity, you know, and um, I often get asked, what's the best advice you never took, right? And I had a sweet, um, a friend of my father's, what am I trying to say? The father of one of my best friends. He's a doctor, brilliant man. He said, Ebony, and I grew up without a father. So he was kind of, you know, a very important role for me. He says, Ebony, never leave a job without a new one. And I said, okay, thank you, doc. Uh, and every job I've ever had has come about with me not having a previous role. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it's just been the situation. I am, for whatever reason, unafraid to leave a situation that no longer serves me. I know what it is because I believe God is testing me. I do. I believe God is saying, I have something really big for you, but let me see if you are as trustworthy as you proclaim. Right. Put the space before I show it to you. Go, go and create the space. And so I say, okay, bet I'm going to leave what's not serving me because I know it's not what you have for me. I'm going to create the space. I'm going to be patient while, right. you, while you prepare what is for me. Right. It's always worked for me, Jay. And, you know, and it's, I see, and I struggle with that. And that goes back to faith, Ebony. It goes back to how strong your faith is because, like, for me, and I guess being in this business in Los Angeles and, you know, you know it's a lot of ups and downs. It's a lot of disappointment. You, you... You always, you know, you sacrifice so much for so little in this business. Yeah. And so you're always wanting to make sure that you're progressing. And sometimes your progress, I'm learning this now with quarantine and how the whole world has come to a stop. And we have to surrender and accept this is what's happening and just hold tight and hang on. But to know that there is something on the horizon and knowing that it's going to come when it's supposed to. Because as... I, look, not to just say as people of color, because I mean, I think this, this sentiment definitely, you know, it resonates with everyone, but we're taught to go out and make it happen. Mm -hmm. You gotta make it, no one's gonna give it to you. Nope. No, it's not, it's not gonna be served to you. We, we don't have, there, we're not privileged in the way of, oh, I know so-and-so, I know so-and-so, mm -hmm. you know, there's nepotism, things of that nature. It's like, you gotta hustle hard. Yeah. And so when you are hustling hard and nothing's coming to fruition, you start to think, okay, well, whatever, whatever capacity, whatever profession, is this for me? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I, you know, am I using my God-given talents? Why isn't this happening for me? But for you, to hear you say that every time that you've had success and you're very successful has been when you, when you said, okay, you know what? I'm going to be faithful and have patience and know and trust. And trust. That and is coming. It. And, and focus on the work. So, right. Do the work. The is in those, because it's some in between. I don't want to yeah. make it like I left Fox and then I got State of the Culture the next day. That did not happen. State of the Culture came a good eight months later. So yeah. there was an eight month window. Let me be extremely clear. Yeah. Where a sister was struggling, right? A sister knew I had talent. I knew I had gifts. I knew I had a resume. I knew I had a million reels. What's going on? What gives? Right. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, I'm calling my agent. What y'all doing with it? You know, just <laughs> put off. Like, <laughs> yo, did you get that email? Hello. What, what, why was I not at that audition? I just saw this was cast. It was good. All of that. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And I, listen. And then I realized instead of doing all this, I need to put my head down and do my work. Because when I went back and I started writing op-eds and I started creating content and doing yeah. things like you're doing now, 
you know, when I focused on the work, that's when the opportunity came. So that was, is what I would say to people that are watching this and, um, you know, at that space of uncertainty and, and stress, do the damn work. When, yes. when, when you don't have a job, you, oh, you got a job. Right. Do, do, do your work. I love when you that. do your work, people, that's when, that's what, revolt came to me. Right. Actually, for say of the culture, because I I, had, I I wasn't thinking, oh, I can't wait to for my next job to go be hosting a show with Joe and Remy and Jinx. That was not my, my mindset. Um, I was I didn't know, um, but because of my work at the Breakfast Club, because I was doing my work, right, right, um, and I was writing op eds, and I was I was I was putting out content that made it clear what my value add would be to a platform. Revolt came to me. Yeah, right. And you put you written some pretty powerful things like for MTV News, etc. Uh, you watching you on State of the Culture, it's I'm seeing like it's again you're so versatile. You're, and I've always thought this, but now we're seeing an Ebony who you, I mean I mean every situation requires a different muscle, a different view, right? On State of the Culture though, we're seeing a laid back Ebony who is <laughs> not a, not afraid to yes. just just it's you've always been authentic, but it's even deeper authenticity now. Is that what you're feeling as well with the show? A hundred percent. I feel extremely emancipated. Um, I do. And, and that's not because of them. That's because of me. Yeah. I'm going to own that. You know, I didn't fully trust that I could show up totally authentically because my authenticity is um, complicated, right? Because yeah. we, we know she's an attorney and we know she's a former beauty queen and we know she was at that network. Um, but she also has a potty mouth and she also is a little bit country and a little bit this and that. So it's a lot of things going on with, with me. Um, and I didn't trust Jason that I could be accepted in my full truth. But I'm so, so happy to report um, that I, I shortchanged our people. I shortchanged the whole audience. I have been completely accepted. And not that everybody agrees with everything I say. Again, that's, that ain't even the, the, the barometer, right? It's that um, I have been given the space and the permission, even by my co-host, and I, I, I give them much credit. Because you know how it is when you come into an existing property. You yes. Know, somebody always, already sat in that seat. Right. People can be... Um, Territorial? Uh, uh, resistant, I'll say that. Uh, and the audience can be resistant, right? Like, who this new girl? It was like two minutes of that. And then it was like, okay, she's, she, she's coming with a pure heart. Um, she's coming with substance that can advance our cause. And, and people have been extremely uh, receptive to that. And I'm very grateful, Jason. So the freedom you guys see now, the relax, the, the say whatever, say it however, showing up with no makeup. Like, I did give y'all some brow filler, though. Um, <laughs> that, is, that is a result. <laughs> because, I care, because I care about you and I value your platform, Jason. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, that is a result of, of also, I'm almost 40 now. Let me be candid. You know, I'm, this is also like tangible growth. Right. Like when, you, when, you, when I came into this part of the business after my legal career, I was 27, you know, and you think that's grown, but it ain't really grown. And now I'm on the cusp of 37 and it's a, it's a different, it's a different vibe. Well, when I get 40, watch, I'm on, all I'm telling you, Jace, when I turn 40, it's going to be a wrap. Well, I'm already 40 and I feel you. Yeah. On, on on that but someone in the comments said that your transition was so smooth and i agree with that 100 and that's one of the things I, I that really just stood out was just like you seem at home you seem at home just in this space I'm, and it's it's when it's when you you mentioned permission mm. and i think at some of these bigger outlets and some of these bigger networks that are not for the culture that are kind of just like oh we're whatever they again they they want you to put on an outfit that's comfortable for them I mean, there's been times there's a lot of times where where i'm like why are we why are we so afraid to dive into blackness and not so and, and or or just culture in general it could be latinx it could be it isn't all you know why are we so afraid of that and the only time we ever want to do that when it's a cardi b when it's a beyonce which those they're great when, but it's like there's so much more too like when when Nipsey hustled last year, that's a perfect example of people finally realizing that oh my gosh, there is the, the culture is important. Yeah. And watching state of the culture that word that's the word of the day culture. 
um, and, this, and seeing how authentic and how organic it is, it's, it's refreshing. Let's talk about you and how you're doing in quarantine, though. What, what, what is a day for Ebony K. Williams in quarantine? Because again, you said you want some filler for me. I did like, that for you. That's normally you. not a part of my regime. I, uh, I'm honored. Out, I'm seeing some, 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 some fam in the comments. Shout out to T. Cooper Beauty. T. Cooper is my hair and makeup stylist on State of the Culture. So these brows are, are not up to T. Cooper's work. Um, but this is the <laughs> best I could do with a little brush and some Anastasia brow powder. That's all I could do. Um, <laughs> uh, shout out to my boy, Kelvin. Listen, Kelvin is somebody I met back. I used to live in L.A. And that's yeah. basically how we know each other. I'm in New York now. I've been here for six years. But, um, you know, people people see you, Jason. They see you on E.T. They see you with Young Turks. Um, and they, they think that that's just overnight. Right. You know, they think that's just, you know, okay, he just went out there and, and then he got a gig on Entertainment Tonight. Nah, man, this shit has been a grind. A um, grind. We, we worked for free. <laughs> for an extremely, I know you're laughing, brother. I gotta put us on blast. And you know what? There's no shame in it, though. There is it. No. There's no shame in it. We were showing up weekly. Yeah. Like after Buzz. Like right. it was our damn job. Right. For free. Yeah. And let me tell you why, people that are watching and listening, because we needed to gain a skill set. And there is no shame in doing some shit for free. Because it's not like it's, you might not need a check, but you're getting paid. Right. You're getting paid by virtue of the ability to learn how to host. I was a hot ass mess when I first got um, to Africa. No. Ah. In, in many ways. You know what I mean? The woman, and let me ask you this, Jason. Let me flip it. When you see me on State of the Culture and you see me um, on Breakfast Club or any of those things, I want you, and, and I, you know, I got thick skin, brother. I want you to honestly tell me the, the evolution that you witnessed from now to what, eight, nine years ago. Well, yeah. Started in this game. Okay. Well, speak to that. Okay, I can speak, hear that. I can speak to that for sure because I, when me and you were hosting at Black Hollywood Live for Afterbus TV, I was thorough. First of all, I was like, "Who is this chick?" She's like, well, well, how, "How are we not friends?" Two, you, your nuance was impeccable when it came to talking about the topics of the day, and and I think we were talking about entertainment. You no, know, nothing that was really heavy or too deep, but you found a way to to make it interesting and to, and, and to keep the conversation going, which is a skill some hosts can't have without a teleprompter and a producer in your ear saying, okay, move on to this. Um, of course, your evolution is, is, is epic from nine years ago because your experiences have, have lent themselves to you becoming this amazing on-camera personality. And you are so right about, about when you work for free. And I said this the other day, and you know, I'm glad you brought it up because it's, you know, a host had reached out to me and was like, Jay, what advice do you have? And I said, just keep showing up. Yes. And uh, you can get a check. Getting a check is cool, but what's priceless is experience and exposure and yes. growing your skill set. I am so thankful for all the times I read out aloud from a magazine daily wanting to not having a teleprompter because it hone that skill of how to deliver something without sounding like you're talking to Ebony K. Williams of State right. of the Culture. Right. right. Throw away the voice of God. Right. Uh, yeah. To Jay, Jay Hamilton, that's my boy. We used to practice law together in North Carolina, and he is still killing the game as a brilliant criminal defense lawyer. Um, but no, that's, that's, that's facts, Jay. And again, when we talk to, to younger talent, uh, uh, I think that's lost. I think yeah. it's lost. I think everybody, you know, because we, we, it's an Instagram culture and everybody really thinks that, that this shit just happens overnight. Um, and I want to just speak to that because it's a process. And also, because I've learned this the hard way, a cautionary tale. If I had to speak of a regret, and this is the first time I'm sharing this. This is actually a Jason Carter exclusive. <laughs> so when I first got an agent, right, first of all, you couldn't tell me nothing. Right? Because I'm signed now. Right. What? Okay. <laughs> so I got <laughs> right. So I got my little agent and I want them to go and I want them to set up generals or meetings with all the executives in the space. And that's what they should do. But a lot of the, the ind industry gatekeepers, vice presidents of programming at everything, CBS yes. News, ABC News, NBC News, E! News, da -da 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 I met those people too early in my career. Right. I feel I that. I met them maybe five, six years ago where I was green and did not have um, 
the, the expertise and the, the who y'all see now is not who I was five years yeah. ago. Let me say it plain. So when, you, when you're pressed to get a meeting and you're pressed to be in a space prematurely, you do yourself a disservice. Because what I know now that I didn't know then is that these executives have very long memories. Right. So although you might show up five, six, seven, ten years even later, much more experienced, much better on camera, with a brand new skill set, guess what they're going to remember? That green, awkward, can barely read a prompter girl or boy that they saw six years ago. Yes. So everybody listening to this, do your work. Stay, put your head down. Stop being impressed about an agent. Stop being impressed about a meeting with so-and-so SVP or so-and-so director of programming or casting. You don't want those people to even see your ass until right. you're ready. Until you're can ready. You, can I get an amen, Jason? A, a freaking man. The truer words, the Bible right now. And, and, it's, and it's because I, I get that. I mean, yes. You know, you, one time I was leading a very popular host, and uh, K-Dub, we took a hosting class together. Hey, K-Dub. Um, I was taking a very popular- Oh, I love K-Dub. That's my boy. Yeah. K-Dub's great. <laughs> a, a very popular hosting class here in LA. And you, and you know, Fox was in West LA, and you came by in a limo, and you, and you rode down the way like, Jason, I was like, hey, what's going on? And oh, yeah! I remember, I remember that. Remember that? Yeah. And it was in, I was, I, you know, I have been a working host then, but I was still in class making sure that I was getting my skills right because you are so right. I've had people reach out to me from three, four years ago that I auditioned for, and luckily it was a great audition. I'm like, hey, you read for us years ago. We looked you up. Can you come back in or we have a job for you? And it's because they remembered the good. And luckily that was a great situation, but there have been times where I've gone and they're like, oh, yeah. And so it's all about doing the work. And if you build it, they will come. And I think, and it, I'm, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because a lot of Me too. I've never had this conversation before, but this would have been a game changer for me. And shout out to my brilliant publicist and also just close, close, close personal friend, Giselle Phelps. We love her. Said, we spoke about, and she taught me this lesson when we first started working together professionally. Capacity matters. Yeah. Capacity matters. You don't want to just be in an audition. You don't want to just be in a room the capacity in which you engage people matters greatly. Yeah. Greatly. And they will remember it. So if, if you, here's a good example. This is, this is, um, this gonna sound petty, but I promise you it's not. So a really good friend of mine from, from like 20 years ago, she's a college friend and love her. And she used to live in New York and she reaches out to me and she's like, Oh, I got tickets to the Wendy Williams show. Like to, you know, be in the audience. She's like, do you want to come? And you know, I love Wendy like everybody else, but I'm like, oh, bitch, no, I can't come be in the audience at Wendy because, <laughs> because when I go to Wendy, it needs, it needs to be as a guest. Right. Dead ass. You know, and that's not arrogance. That's not anything but respect Facts. my capacity. Right. And it took three years, but God is good. And this year, in 2020, I made my debut um, as a guest on Wendy Williams' Hot Topic panel. Yeah. But that, that's a lesson in capacity. That's right. a lesson in saying, you don't, you don't ever be so pressed to be there and meet them. And that's another thing. I see a lot of pictures on Instagram of, of talent with people, but you're really showing up as a fan. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just be mindful right. that you are compromising a bit of your capacity. Because you're going to, if you do what you do well, you will meet that person later in life again. Right. And you will be able to say that you showed up in honest capacity. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I, I did not expect, well, I know I'm lying. I did expect to be moved this morning with our conversation, Eve, because you're phenomenal. What's next for you? You, Woo. you, I mean, besides getting married. Um, yeah, 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 that's uh, amazing. Great. Woo. But you, you, know, you know, I'm about the business, Jason. But, <laughs> but, um, but um, yeah. For me is continuing my work with the culture. Obviously, I have a podcast. People have been asking for the podcast. Um, Y'all are right. What I can promise you is that when this podcast comes out, which will be this calendar year, I promise and guarantee you that, it will be worth the wait, baby. This ain't going to be no bullshit. This is going to be content oh. that you've never seen before. I am going to use all of my spiritual gifts to give you an entirely new experience on this podcast. And so Love. I cannot wait to share it with y'all.
So the podcast is coming. And I have, and you know the lingo, Jason, a big swing project um, in the works. Uh, can't talk too much about it. But it's, it's, it's time for me to show up in this full auntie capacity. So. Love it. And it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. We got the book pretty powerful. We have State of the Culture. We got the podcast. Got your, got your sip going. Ebony, it has been such a pleasure to reconnect, to talk to, to see you, and to have this conversation. I wish you all the best. You are a treasure, and you are so essential. And I'm, I, I, I look up to you. I, I, oh, I cherish don't, you. Don't make me cry this little bit of Pat McGrath and Sarah <laughs> off I got on. And um, thank you for your time, and thank you for your kindness. Where can they find you on social media? Uh, at Ebony, E-B-O-N-I, K Williams, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it's all the same. Jason, I'm incredibly proud of you, brother. You know, again, I, I, when you see people that you grew up with in the trenches uh, amassed to this level and know that they're going beyond, it's a blessing. And you know what? It's an affirmation, Jason, that we were, we were on the right track. Yeah. We were on the right track. We've been doing the right thing, and we've been surrounding ourselves with the right people. So I'm so proud of you. I love you. Uh, continue to shine, brother, because you're doing it. Thank you so much, E. You take care, and I'll talk to And I'll see you on State of the Culture, and you be yes. well, okay? Awesome. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.